Uh, today we're going to start probably what I think is um, good over a few weeks because it's such an important subject, and that is the science and the art, finding the balance between the two. It's an ongoing process. It sure is. Um, for me, it started in, I would say, if I wanted to be really accurate, uh, it started in early 87, 1987, when I was training for the world tournament. And I'd been surrounded by, I was doing some human movements at Queensland Uni, surrounded by a lot of very talented scientific minds. And it made me realise how unscientific our training was. At the same time, it, it, it struck me with a little awe of how incredibly smart the Kyokushin system, training system yeah. had been put together. It was the, the, the process of the warm-up, the basics, the moving basics, and then the kumite, then the warm-up. It's, it's brilliant. There are moments in there that are quite brilliant. Having said that, the general approach to tournament preparation was really poor. So it became an interesting challenge for me to try and find a more scientific way to uh, produce um, results in the training. That became a really interesting ongoing challenge is to how, how to optimise training. Because at the end of the day, I mean, you were just talking about before how athletic events and many, many Olympic events, it's just... A, a matter of run faster, run further, that sort of thing, easily yeah. measured, right? Yeah, there's certain events, that's right, that are easily measured in sports. For example, the 100 metre, any track and field event is easily measured. You ran X distance at X time. It's objective. Weightlifting's another one. You lifted the weight, you completed the lift or you didn't. High jump's another one. You, know, you jump over this or long jump and so on. So there's certain events that are absolute and they're so easily to measure. But then there's other sports and activities that are less easy to measure. And, for example, certain aspects of the martial arts do fall into that category. Mm. So we can sometimes go down a path that may not be in our highest and best good training-wise. Yes. And the other thing, too, is we have such faith in the art, but we forget that it's very easy to drift away from intelligent scientific approach. We put such faith in the art that we don't even realise that sometimes the training we're doing, uh, and I'm speaking in terms of tournament fighting, the sporting aspect of it, but we don't realise that sometimes the training we're doing is actually quite detrimental, or in fact, really, really detrimental to the results, um, mainly because of the psychology that we've imbued through our training. Absolutely, yes. Um, Mitch mentioned one of his strong influences uh, it's this book here. Is this the one? It's one of them, yeah. Yeah. This book, Training for Speed by Charlie Francis. You could get that online in uh, ebook form. It's excellent. Um, I've read his book called Speed Trap, which is more probably a political commentary. It is, and it explains his journey of being a sprint coach. It's a, um, it's a less, yeah, it's a, that's right. It's more of a story yes. with incredible wisdom in it. I highly recommend Speed Trap because it's got a brilliant training concepts in there. But this one is purely training. And Charlie Francis, for those who aren't sure, was the coach of Ben Johnson, who won the gold medal in the in the eighty eight Seoul Olympics, and then promptly got disqualified for steroids. And then this book, Speed Trap. Even the name is a good name because it points out that the reality of athletics is that uh, if you're not, you, you don't use steroids in many, in many sports, you don't use steroids to get an advantage. You use steroids to overcome the disadvantage that you have because everyone else is using Oops. steroids. And it's an interesting fact that I found from uh, reading that book, Speed Trap, widespread abuse of performance-enhancing drugs. Well, performance-enhancing drugs have been around forever. In, I even wrote about in my book about the Tour de France and how 120 years ago they would, were using all kinds of drugs to get an advantage, quite often just alcohol, to numb the pain. Uh, 
But widespread use of steroids began in the Melbourne Olympics around the time of the Melbourne Olympics in 1956. Now, that's very interesting because the Olympics didn't introduce uh, a testing regime for uh, steroids until 1975. So you had 20 years of unaffected do do what you want. And then in 1975, 1976 was always because they introduced steroids. I'd, I'd, I haven't looked. I reckon it'd be fun to look at the times and results of the uh, 1976 Olympics. I think it was in Canada, Edmonton, Canada, if I read, somewhere like that, Toronto or somewhere. Okay, I can't remember. Okay. Yeah, it was in Canada. I remember that much. Uh, that's right, you weren't alive yet. It wasn't then. <laughs> <laughs> it was the year I was in Japan. Um, but interestingly, it was probably the first year since probably Helsinki that Australia didn't win a gold medal wow. and the only Olympics since that we haven't won a gold medal it's interesting it's interesting not I don't you know I refuse to make comment on the grounds that might incriminate me but interesting interesting stat you know now you've been along with Ian King's work this Charlie Francis's book has been quite influ- uh, influential there Mike got it in Montreal, Montreal and it was in Canada somewhere yeah that's been quite influential in your training um, and study. And professional work, yeah, enormously. Um, I think I first got this book, it would have been in the very late 1990s, maybe the year 2000, I can't remember. And, um, yeah, Charlie Francis's work. Ian was a big champion of Charlie's work. That They did some seminars together um, before Charlie passed a few a few years ago. And um, so Ian put me on to Charlie's work, and he was so ahead of his time in terms of sprint work and – preparing the athlete for that and what we've got to remember today as well he was doing all this in the late 70s to mid 80s so this is a long time ago. this is 40 plus years ago Mm. he had these insights he was talking about the nervous system he was talking about regeneration and recovery in ways that still today some people don't talk about and certainly they do more because information the internet has spread things a lot but so ahead of his time it's incredible and the other thing that's really interesting too is the tracks that they ran on. So Charlie's sprinters or all sprinters back then ran on softer tracks. Tartan tracks get graded from my understanding in terms of hardness. And back then the tracks were a little softer. And if anyone hears this, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe that the tracks have become harder. So put his sprinters on these harder tracks, they run even faster today than they did 40 years ago. So it's very insightful and um humbling just to the depth and breadth of his work and how far ahead of his time he really was yeah it's interesting you say that because you you go right back to some of the early olympics and you look at the times remember that american sprinter who won the uh, olympics in like 1948 1942 around that time i've uh, forgotten his name very famous um african-american sprinter that that blew poor old Adolf Hitler's brain because he wanted all his um, Nazi-trained uh, athletes to win, and this guy just killed them all. But when you do a comparison of his Jesse Owens, there Jesse you go, Owens. Mike, you're on the button again, Jesse Owens. Um, when you compare his times and then you look at the equipment, I think his running shoes yes. were like these old leather things, and the tracks he was running on were basically grass mm. or you know, compacted sand or something like this. They weren't even tartan tracks. And when you compare his times to what they were doing today, he was absolutely phenomenal phenomenal yeah. athlete. But the thing about Charlie Francis, I've read through the book. I've started to read it. Um, yeah, I was a beach sprinter too, Mark. I agree with you. Um, running on the beach teaches you to use every square millimetre of your toes and everything, the way you dig your toes in. And I've read through the book the the introduction of the book i'm still reading it this is training for speed by charlie francis what are some of the insights that you got from the book from charlie francis uh from well i I gotta pair it with ian too because um charlie had a significant influence on ian and a lot of their methodology was similar so i it's difficult for me to go back 20 years plus and be super accurate on it but the thing i got from charlie francis a couple of main things were, and I went to a seminar with Charlie as well um, many, many years ago. Yeah, do, right. Yeah, for a couple of days. Mm. So he'd do the mornings would be a theoretical session on his planning and so on, and the afternoon session would be on the track and doing technical work. That's pretty cool that you did a seminar with him. That's like 
These days, people looking back, Masayama's been dead for 30 years. Charlie Francis didn't die until 2010. But then people go, oh, man, you train with Masayama. The fact that you did a seminar with Charlie Francis, I find very, very cool. That must have been fascinating yeah, to actually was... see the man, the way he would do things. And Yeah, it was it was really great. And the, the couple of biggest things I got from Charlie's uh, writings and from seminar with him was firstly quality work, the intensity of work, the difference between technical work and actually intense work. He was quite reserved in doing super high intensity work. Um, and we'll probably talk about this more in this uh, session. Um, he wouldn't go and just train hard every day, that kind of mentality. It would be two or three times a week. He'd do his intense work and intensity and volume. So how hard you do something and how long you can do that thing at that intensity for is one of the facts of training. There's an inverse relationship between volume and intensity in training. Okay, there are a few facts, but that is one of them. And that's that's easy to see when you simply look at running. Yes. You can run at 100% intensity for 100 metres. For a short period of time. Yeah. And then your intensity, but the actual performance will drop. Mm. So he was very clear on that. So he was the, the lighter sessions and the technical work you want to do at a lower intensity and really focus on that. And then the high intensity work, you want to do technically well, but you've only got a short envelope or capacity to do that high intensity work initially, sort of like you talked about last week, Xi'an, when you develop new skills, your performance yes. drops. Um, so that was the first thing. And the second thing was regeneration. He, what he called regeneration, what I call recovery. He was huge focus on that and a massive advocate on tissue work, on stretching, on hot therapy, cold therapy, on vitamins, on sleep. All these types of things. It was, it was. It's not a. In the Western world, we often get taught to don't worry about that stuff. Just train, train, train. But the reality is, an Eastern Bloc approach to training um, is far more. It's the recovery work you do is just as planned and prepared as the physical work that we do. And that's a lot of the stuff that I do in my coaching work as well. People are quite surprised by how much focus goes into that. One of the things that comes to mind when I read Charlie Francis is the importance of being able to ask the right questions. Quite often because of our lack of scientific, intelligent training in the martial arts, we don't ask the right questions. One question I'd ask you, and you you touched upon it there, is what exactly is recovery? We think recovery is going home and having a good sleep. But what is recovery? Well, it, going home and having a good sleep is a, probably the, the number one thing you can do in recovery. I think we've all been through stages of life, especially you, Sean, going through it now with a newborn, where your sleep's not good, it's very challenging to recover. Life isn't much fun when you don't do that as well. But recovery is <sighs> – I think that's me just boring you. Um, <laughs> uh, recovery is – it, it, it's during recovery that adaptation to training happens. So things in – and recovery it helps us accelerate – uh, and adapt to the training stress. That, and we talked about this last week. And then not just adapt, but super compensate. The body moves to a high level. So th the point of doing regenerative or recovery techniques is to accelerate the body's ability to recover and adapt to the training stimulus we give it. And that means it's not just your energy. It's your muscle length and tension. So if you run hard stairs or hills or something like that, you'll find that you're sore the next day if you're not used to it. So we can do things that aren't going to fix it entirely, but we can accelerate the body's ability, the connective tissues, the soft tissues' ability to recover. The nervous system, we can do things like hot and cold therapy to settle the body down, to relax it a little bit, for example. Nutrition for our metabolic recovery, for the nutrients and the glucose and the protein breakdown, the fats we burn um, during recovery, hydration and electrolytes that we lose through sweating. So these are all aspects of recovery that we can plan and individualize over time because it's not just set in stone. It, one, it, it, it does individualize person to person, of course, but there are general themes that we can really dig into and make a big difference to, to, our, to our training adaptations because Ian has a saying that he put in one of his books, I've forgotten which one it is, but he says training plus recovery equals a training effect. And that's kind of lost on a lot of people because just training gives you a training effect. There's no doubt about that, but it may not be the one you want. But training plus optimal recovery gives you the training effect indeed and that minimizes injury too that's a whole nother thing that we talk about people will train 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 sometimes get injured and they don't realize the training was moving them towards breakdown yeah one thing that i noticed that charlie francis pointed out 
is because he was an he was a world class athlete at one stage he was ranked fifth or sixth in the world in yeah, 100, 100 meters so he really knew his stuff but he pointed out that it wasn't until he started to add the art to the science that he actually he felt that he could actually never really consistently train or run or perform at his maximum he was always sub maximal because he never learned the art of recovery hmm. and i think sometimes the art of recovery is literally having the courage to go you know what i'm going to back off today i'm not going to do the intensity i'm going to have a nice stretch have a swim go to the beach and give my brain time to recover just as much as my body and i think that's one area that we really underestimate the number of people that i've known or who have contacted me over the years they, they they're not exhausted physically they're, they're they're dying to do more they're exhausted mentally yes and it's difficult to separate in this western world we often want to separate we even have therapy now where people just look after your knee or shoulder and so on but it's hard it's difficult to separate all tra physical training has a psychological impact there's no question about it and something that ian talks about is recovery and rest and recuperation is not just to adapt to the, the training block we've just done, but it's also an investment in our psychological motivation and energy for our future next training block. Exactly. It's, so, it's, so, it's so easy to say, yeah, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go. But when you're week three into a six week or a four week block of training and things are getting difficult, that training block that you didn't recover enough a few weeks ago, it comes back to bite you because fatigue is not, fatigue is residual. It's not, doesn't work on a seven day calendar just because we as human beings operate on a seven day calendar. It doesn't mean come Monday and you're training again every that you're fresh and ready to go. You know? um, Ian said something and I paraphrase it all the time. You train today so that tomorrow's training can be the best it can be. And I think that's a very powerful quote. And you said something before is that you notice that sometimes people train according to their emotion of that day they're full of energy they yeah i'm going to go for it i'm going to have a really really good day but they're not thinking long term are they no that's right if if we train just to how we emotionally felt um it probably wouldn't be the best outcome to be quite honest and um and physical training has such a benefit on our thinker on our mental health and well-being i understand why people do it and i think Overall in life, it's a, not a bad thing to do. But if we're talking about tournament preparation, we're talking about performance for a period of time, it's important to be objective and rational in our training rather than emotional um, because you can burn out very quickly being emotional. Beware of the emotional reactions to the inevitable, inevitable fluctuations, fluctuations of the, the phenomenal, phenomenal world. world. Exactly. Emotions will... Most people either, either over-exaggerate emotionally or undervalue emotionally. The, the reality is remove the emotions so that you can focus on the reality of the situation right now. And I think um, that's a really important thing when it comes to training is, is remove the emotions so that you don't get so excited you overtrain. So exactly. simple. Because um, at the end of the day, overtraining is as much a psychological problem as it is physiological, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a real issue. And this is one of the reasons having a training plan is such an important thing. You've talked about so many, and I know personal examples, and you've spoken about it before as well, over the years of planning training and prep periods with athlete, with um, Karateka to ensure that they peak at a certain event or a certain, certain tournament and so on. Um, it becomes very important to follow that plan. It does. And uh, combined with that, see, the problem is the martial arts, the art of the martial arts, in general, it doesn't address a scientific approach to training enough, whereas the general approach that supposedly um, athletic preparation coaches and so on have is it's too much science and not enough art. Exactly. And this whole thing, that the theme that we're looking for is how do you balance the two? How do you find the two? And that takes a lot of experience. A lot of the stuff I did back in the, I started thinking about this in the 80s and the 90s, there was a lot of um, trial and error. 
we were I was lucky that I got it right more often than wrong because I was using uh, the examples of people, great leaders before me, you know, particularly I've often said that um, I referred to world-class swim coaches and things like this because their training methodology is right at the very pointy end. Um, so, And there's certain, sorry to jump in, Joe, no. there's certain training that's uh, and that's easy to measure and there's other training that's difficult to measure. So the things that are easy to measure in athlete preparation are things like VO2 max, a cyclical sports, running, swimming, rowing, cycling. These are very easy to measure. Or in karate, how many push-ups push -ups and sit-ups and squats did you do in a session? And exactly. Mm. Um, but it, there are some other things that are less easy to measure. And for that, you need intuition, experience, some wisdom. And that's, that's the art of, of training comes into it a little bit more. Um, and there's the, the importance of being able to say enough is enough. I think that is so important. It's like when I do a drawing or a painting, sometimes you, you just want to keep uh, enough is enough. You just want to stop it. And something you just said then, the, probably the biggest thing I learned from Charlie Francis and reading his books is the, the simple saying, less is more. Charlie would often say less is more in training, especially when it comes to intensity. He would say at a certain intensity, he would listen to the, the the footsteps the ground reaction time of your sprinters and he would hear that because it'd be cyclical right and when it was too long he would cut the session no matter what was written on the piece of paper or the program that day he would cut it isn't that fascinating it is it's so insightful that seems incredible because people want to stick to their plan and do more and mm. especially in a, like in a, i know this goes around the world but the australian culture i can just speak that a little bit Australians have a very endurance-based culture. We, we, it's a harsh land that you grow up here in Australia. There's a lot of things that can kill you and hurt you. We're surrounded by water. It, it has a very endurer-type mentality. So it's very common in, that, in our culture to, to push on and one more and don't be soft and that kind of thing. And there's a time and place for that. I'm not suggesting there's not at all. But if you want to um, ensure that training, we're just talking about peaking here for certain aspects of training, the, 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 it needs a certain quality. And as soon as that quality is not met, you're now rehearsing something you do not want. So how much time do you want to spend rehearsing something you do not want? I'll tell you, zero time. Mm. And that can be emotionally difficult to register for people, but it is so important. And Charlie Especially in Kyrgyzstan. It's very difficult to register that because there's this, there's this culture of soft. If you don't do the 1,000 push-ups or if you don't do the 100 squats, you're soft. I've seen times over the years where someone has said, yeah, no, I'm good. And people have thought they were soft, but they're getting the results. Um, I think that is the, the courage to actually go, no, I'm actually, that's, it, it, that's the balance between the science and the art is being able to do that. Be, it's just so it's valuable. What, it's what you say too, Sean. The body is a treacherous, uh, what's the saying? The body treacherous is, friend. Treacherous friend. I always say the body is honest but treacherous the mind is loyal but dishonest this is dishonest yeah. it will try to trick you because it's loyal the body will lie to you because it's treacherous yes so there's that aspect in it as well so at no point are we saying that intense difficult push there's a time and a place for everything in training and i think the message that we're sharing today is that there's also a time and place for rest recovery to add up to training and to implement these different modalities, um, sleep. For example, this might sound funny to some people, but um, I've been in, prepar in preparation with athletes and we actually plan sleep into their training. And you might say, gee, that sounds good. And it is good, but they have to have an afternoon sleep, 20 minutes to an hour or whatever happens to be for that person. It's part of their training and recovery because if they don't do that, they will break down. That's how much of a fine line they're on with things. So these things are all used um, depending how committed you are to a, to an absolute outcome. Yes. The question, the magic question that Charlie Francis points out is all about the quality of delivery of the training methods. So that means the questions like when, where even, how much, that sort of thing. How long should the session be? What is the makeup of the session? How do you start it? How do you end it? Um, how much recovery do you plan into the program? Why do you plan it? You, you plan it. You, 
people will create program. This is what annoys me. They'll create a program based on something they've read, not even questioning whether it's actually proven and swear by it. And if you suggest something different, they'll, uh, it's almost like heresy. But they know no better themselves. No. Mike's come up point. Can I ask why footballers have to go for a dip in the ocean after a big match? And they do, uh, like with race horses. Yep. Um, first, Sensei Mike, the main reason that someone started doing it and everyone kind of does it, there's a lot of trend following in training. Uh, it's just an accepted practice largely now. Um, but there is value, I believe, in doing that. And there's a few reasons for it. Firstly, um, the research around it isn't great, to be quite frank. Um, last time I looked into it, the, it's difficult to measure this. I th and I think this is one of the things, Sensei, that's difficult to measure. Um, but the empirical effects are pretty significant. So, for example, football has been running, depending on the position, they might have run 2 to 10 or 20 kilometres per game, depending on the football sport we're talking about. So getting their body into a cold environment from a hot environment is a contrast. Getting them off their legs into a non-weight-bearing environment and aqueous in, is a contrast. Um, exposing the skin to water is generally a relaxing thing. It's a cleansing thing. It can help reduce fatigue. It can help reduce the emotional aspects of the physical sport they've just played. Um, all those types of aspects, uh, it's a time for bonding, it's a time of relaxation, it makes people feel good, and they can also use different temperatures. So sometimes um, there's a trend at the moment of, you know, ice baths and really cold, and it's debatable how much effect that has. I've done it, and I, I think there's some value in it. How much? Again, it depends. It's, it's more of an art, I think, but you've got temperature um, in terms of just normal beach conditions, you've got cold, and you've got hot saunas spas and that kind of thing as well and i think all these contrasts are good for the body um for the connective tissue to soften and to relax in the warmer environments uh, and the nervous system to settle down a little bit as well in the cold environments and there's also the psychological benefits of getting outside into the getting out of the dojo down the beach beautiful warm day the negative, negative ions, ions exactly all that stuff that's yeah. the next thing i was going to go and it's really interesting um, a, a lot of sporting teams these days, they beat their chests about their recovery facilities. We see it so much. I'm not going to name teams, but there's one for I can thinking of right now who they, they played their best football ever um, and got the highest rating um, in their league when they were training literally out of a shed and didn't have much, would go to the beach and so on. Then a few years later, they got this incredible recovery facility that was just amazing and they didn't do half as well. Mm. And I'm not saying there's a correlation, that's just you know, just a coincidence more likely. But I just found it really interesting. I think we underestimate going to the beach, getting out in nature. And, eat, for example, Eastern Blocks talk about forest. The word forest, if you read it, uh, spell it out, it's F-O-R-R-E-S-T. -E so for rest. That's where we want to go actually to rest and to recover and to lay on the grass and be in the sun and that kind of thing. And Masayama. Yeah, talk, you've said talked that. about all the time. Even in his books, he always talked about being in nature, surrounded by nature and things like that. It's amazing how far we've come. Mitch, how far do you think we can keep evolving? Enormously. Um, I, I really do think there's, there's so much opportunity for improvement, but it comes to a word that you've mentioned a couple of times, Shiana, and it's the courage. It takes a lot of courage to do something different when a group of people are doing a certain behavior and then you take on a different behavior and then and it takes a lot of courage to individualize the training process and know um where you need to be doing certain things so yeah. it, it that's that's i believe the next step of it and i'll give you a personal example on this i'm very big on stretching um something i've learned from ian i, I found old karate journals i used to stretch 45 minutes before every karate session as a kid and uh, then i'd go to karate and we do a lot of stretching and for the last 15 years, 20 years, static stretching before training has been heteracy. You do not do it. And I've had so many people come up and why are you doing this and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I did it anyway. And we get such benefits because what's done first in the session gets the best result. And people, when you compare their flexibility, strength, speed, and endurance, their flexibility is usually the weakest. And as we age, connective tissue is a viscoelastic in nature. We, we, we get shorter and tighter as a, and dehydrated as we age and gravity acting upon us. We have to put prioritize that. But emotionally, people find that challenging. A highly recognised, well-known scientific research papers, which I think are heresy, the, 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 they reeked with poor 
research and preparation. So their argument was that uh, more flexibility equaled more injury based on very, very poor research. Um, so this is the sort of thing you're going to have to face with scientists as well. You know, the fact is that of all the, uh, the four main somatics, the one that has most beneficial impact on the others is flexibility training. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. And even Masayama says, real fighting is the lifeblood of karate. Kumite training is the foundation of real fighting. Kata is the foundation of kumite. Ido geiko, moving basics, is the foundation of kata. Kihon, or sta static basics, is the foundation of moving basics. And flexibility is the foundation of basics. Wisdom. He said flexibility is the basics of basics. I mean, and that is just, you know, he said that a long time ago. So he was really on the money and he placed a lot of importance in flexibility. Uh, I think if there is anything that you can take away from today at this stage anyway is how important it is to have the courage to back off and give yourself a chance to rest and recover and look into recovery modalities, hot, cold, the beach, going for a swim, getting a massage. Back in the... We're in Margaret Street. So Margaret Street was the 80s. And we would go and get a massage once a week. Brilliant. Yeah. And if we could afford to, we probably would have gone more regularly. Yeah. You know. That's exactly right. They, they, all of these things are so, so important. Um, and you've got to lean into um, getting, we call it getting in touch with your body so you can feel what makes a difference and what doesn't and what's helpful and what's useful and so on. Like Anthony says, you, you're talking about, doing everything you can to keep your training optimal. Yeah. Optimal is the key word. And that's, I think I got that off Ian King. Yeah. I'm fairly certain rather than train maximally, you train optimally. Yes, that's it's correct. such intelligence because what is maximal training compared to what is optimal training? Well, optimal training gives you maximum beneficial results. Maximum training just burns you out. Yeah. It's such a subtle difference. So like Ant says there, you know, it's all about keeping your training optimal. Even now, I know at my age when I'm training, as long as I keep my flexibility going, I'm at least able to move um, with a degree of comfort. Science should not take the tenet of hard training away. Yeah, of course. I think that's the key, though, this is what they're finding that balance between the science and the art is is very important you know so anyway yes i was just going to say um and you and i remember watching videos of kyokushin fighters preparing for tournaments in hiroshi Shian, and every video i saw of him with um yamaki and kazumi and midori and all of these guys um he, he was often sitting in seiza and he was discussing technical things with them he was working on technical things and then they would do obviously difficult training and very hard rounds and so on but it was that balance i found interesting and Shan, you would do exactly the same thing mm. we, you know we would train and you would focus on get this right get this cox cone get the footwork right make sure you're on that toe all the time mm. heel off the ground all these technical things it wasn't just go hard hard there was a time of hard hard, mm. hard but it was done at a certain um quality and Salso was like that too. I have to say, when I was Uchideshi, uh, and when I was training at Hombu even before Uchideshi, um, Salso would do a session with us every week. And it was never, ever about how hard you could train. Morning was the hard training one where, where they do really good flexibility work, really good stamina work and so on. And every now and then Salso would turn up. But when he was taking sessions, he was – zeroing in that the clearer the detail the finer the process the yes. clearer the detail and that was really really important to salsa he would just repeat the same thing over and over and over his theory being well if you get it right i won't have to keep repeating it. yeah you know he would just keep just drilling it yes weight's wrong your weight's wrong you know you can see it you can get someone to do something their weight is just that little bit wrong they don't believe you they can't see it 
but then you okay, just put your weight and then the light goes on and they go, wow, now I get it. Well, that's the, the art of the technique. The science is why is that better? When you put your weight there, why? And, and over the years, for example, one area which I really love is the, the, process, the concept of impulse. Impulse, roughly speaking, and in terms of the way I use it, is time on target. So the example you can use when someone falls out of a 10-story building in a fire and hits the side of the footpath, they go from terminal velocity to zero in that length of time, and the result is horrific. Whereas the same person can jump out of the same window and hit the same footpath, but in between them is a fireman's balloon, and they decelerate from from uh, terminal velocity to zero over a length of time. And the result is it's so much fun, they want to go back up and do it again. So the outcome is the same from terminal velocity to zero, but the timing of it is different. One is over a period of time. Two is a short period of time. So when you, you think in terms of impact, when you hit someone, that's why they say don't push your punches keep your punches sharp and snappy because the time on target um, is what does the damage. I know, uh, not that I've ever hit anyone, I would never hit anyone, but I've I've heard about guys, uh, you hit, bang, and you knock someone flying and they get up and they're angry. But another time, it's a surprise, you just go, bang, like that, and they're unconscious and they fall straight to their feet with a broken jaw or something, that's the difference between impulse. Well, that's how you use science, using science like how to use momentum, how to, you know, kinetic energy, all these sort Stretch of things. Stretch shortening cycle, distance, Stretch short accuracy, yes. and its timing. That's right. All these things add a science. When you use a stretch shortening cycle and the tendon reflex in your training, this is something we started to do back in the 80s and 90s, and I guarantee no one was doing no it, way. you know. It was just so good. It is. And that's the aspect when we talk about hard training and so on. It's very, it's difficult. It's a challenge to do technically really great striking because mm. elbow position is a little bit different. Your cox cone's not where it needs to be. These are challenging things when mm. there's fatigue involved. And I think without recording your training and and, te and really testing it against non-compliant opponents, we can sometimes kid ourselves about how hard we're actually training because mm. it's hard, but then there's getting better. Mm. And there too, there's a, there's a mix, and that's the art and the science of great training. Yeah, and all the different impact sports have worked on different ways to try and resolve that problem. So this is why boxers they use floor to ceiling balls, they use a speed bag, they use heavy punching bags, they use mitts. These are all really interesting innovations. Yes, which address different areas of your technique. And then Muay Thai does the same thing, of course. Kyokushin, they use the big mitt. All these things are designed to approximate the exact specificity or the specific nature of your sport to try and find the uh, answer. Yes. So, again, it addresses what we were talking about last time was a specific adaptation to impose demand. But anyway, I think um, some interesting points. I'd like to continue this discussion uh, in the future too. Mitch, because I think you have such a depth of knowledge about this that we could perhaps even present some more concrete ideas to people about recovery and also about training preparation and training itself. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. This is a field I absolutely love and work in. So yeah, good on you. It's Just so elbow good. me to shut up. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I would never do that because I think um, uh, you you you're a, a one of those rare combinations of a Kyokushin black belt who also understands the science of, of training, but also you know how to balance that, thanks to people like Charlie Francis and Ian King, who are probably two of your main mentors. Yeah, without doubt, those two. Yes. Right. Well, they give you that beautiful balance of art and science. Um, but anyway, I hope you got something out of that. For me, anyway, the number one thing you can take away is recovery is actually a part of the training process. process. Like Ian says, training plus recovery is it the... Equals the training effect. The effect, exactly. So listen, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. 
Um, I'm trying to hit the million mark at this rate. It'll be about 2075 before I get there. Um, share knowledge. You know, if you've got a website, uh, if you've got a, a YouTube, uh, Facebook, please just send the link to people. Get people to come along and have a look. Hit subscribe, hit the bell, all that sort of stuff. Leave a comment, please. If you do leave a comment, that'd be great. Um, my Patreon family, I love you very much. You're actually, you've been awesome. And you've actually got me in many respects through COVID, being able to do this. Everything I have, that light, that light, the microphone, the computer, uh, as, as a result of, of Patreon. So I really, really, very thank you. Well, thank you for sharing um, what you do and being open to these conversations as well. I actually had someone message me um, last week that, that watches these videos uh, and he said i'm so glad Xiang cameron is sharing in this way because years ago i remember when i came to live with you in brisbane in i think it was 97 this didn't exist we, i had to drive live uproot my life and move to brisbane to live in there to train with you and get these experiences and now i mean it's not exactly the same but everyone around the world can can just look it up it's just it's a phenomenal world that we live in it's an instant world and wow the internet has changed everything but don't rely on it too much. You've mm. still got to do the hard work. Just because you watch something, just because uh, you can repeat something, it doesn't mean you understand it. It means you, you still have to do the hard work. Like Anthony said, science should not take the place of hard training. Okay, that's really valuable. Always, even uh, Shigeru Oyama, one of Soul Side's first top students, always said, train first, talk later. Oof. That's the answer. So anyway, we've done so much talking, we're embarrassed now. But I hope you got something out of that. Please uh, share. And if you've got any comments, by all means, leave them below. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Us.